Yes? Yes. All right. Last summer, my husband and I, we visited Washington, D.C. I love museums, and I was very excited to see if we couldn't maybe get into some of the Smithsonian. But many of the museums were still closed or they had limited access. We were fortunate to be able to get into the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I don't know if any of you have had a chance. Yeah, I, amazing. Um, I could have spent an entire day there as it was. We were there just four hours. Felt like I just skimmed the surface. Um, the music and entertainment exhibits included Chuck Berry's 1973 bright red Cadillac convertible. That was fun to, to see. And I was so impressed that just about every exhibit had an equal representation of women and men. There was a lot to celebrate, but of course, there was also much to mourn. Probably the most sobering for me was the display that focused on lynching. I confess, I, I honestly felt like I was going to vomit as I read the uh, accounts of the African American women and men uh, who were physically brutalized and lynched. This haunting picture is reminiscent, I think, of Jesus' own death, and we're certainly thinking about this now uh, during Lent. We think of the forgiveness that we have in Christ, the songs that we sang even just now, remembering that. And Paul teaches also about another aspect of Christ's work. As I mentioned last night, he, Christ brings peace. He makes the two one, Jew and Gentile. And Christ creates in himself one new humanity, one new anthropos. This new people, they're members of God's household. They, are, they make up the body of Christ. And the book of Ephesians develops the metaphor of the church as Christ's body in several ways, including an emphasis on oneness and unity, and also a focus on maturity and growth. So I'd like to focus right now on oneness created by the cross. See, in Paul's world, the society was highly stratified. The social structure was built on three basic pairs of subordinate, superordinate. So you, this is something that Aristotle did uh, centuries earlier. You have the wife husband, you have the child father, and you have the slave owner. Subordinate, superordinate. This construct shaped the family and by extension then the city government. I think it's important for us to recognize that Paul was given these social categories. And then there was another social category, Jew and Gentile, the people of God and idolaters. So Paul presents the work of Christ's cross and resurrection within this cultural construction. So if we turn now to Ephesians chapter two, verses 11 and following, I want you to imagine that there is a group of 20 or so believers who are all listening to this letter being read. There's gonna be Jews and Gentiles in this group, slaves and perhaps an owner or two. There'll be this category called freed men and freed women, because when you were freed of your slavery, you didn't become free. You got into this middle category called freed, a freed man, freed woman. There may have been one or two wealthier people at this gathering. It may be that Priscilla read the letter to the group or she and her husband Aquila, because they served in the Ephesian church. She was a teacher. Maybe Aquila read it. My guess is that there was a Jewish believer who read it. I think Jewish believers probably made up the bulk of the leaders in the first generation of the church because they would have been familiar with the Holy Scripture. So looking at verses 11 through 22, we see Paul's context here is describing these Gentiles who remain Gentiles, but no longer pagan. They are now believers. And Paul reminds them in verses 11 through 13, these Gentile believers in their recent past, they were alienated from God. Gentiles were the uncircumcised. They were not part of the citizenship of Israel. They were foreigners to the covenants and the promises. They were without hope. Paul says they were without God. 
but they're not left out in the wilderness for the blood of Christ brings them near. And so we see in verses 14 through 16, Paul says, Christ is our peace. And this peace, it has a creative energy. It creates a new entity before God, a new people based on God's promises that those who were far away are brought near. And this peace makes the two one. I think it's another way of saying, by grace you have been saved. Simultaneously, the believer is forgiven and made new reconciled to God and to others, those who had even been their enemies. The scope of Christ's work on the cross extends then from personal forgiveness to remaking the people of God. This peace, and here I'm moving now to verse 17 through 22, this peace makes Gentiles fellow citizens of Israel, God's people. And this is a Trinity type of community, right? Because it's through Christ that we have access to the Father through the one spirit. And Paul imagines this unity as a temple built on Christ's work. Now, the context of Ephesus makes this image of the people of God as temple, I think, even more poignant. For the city was the keeper of Artemis' temple, and Artemis ruled over her city. Her temple was about uh, many times, and maybe even seven times larger than the Athenian Parthenon. So it was enormous. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And the Ephesian Gentile believers raised in that city would have seen parades uh, regularly through their city onto the sanctuary. And I would think they likely participated in some of those rituals, but now they imagine themselves as being drawn to a new temple, in fact, even being a new temple. Well, as I got to think about that, I wondered how, how did Paul expect this unity to be expressed in his congregation? So I wanna to turn to Ephesians chapter five, verses 18 through 21 to start thinking about this. When you look at 5, 18 through 21, and I think this is in the context, Paul's talking in the context of worship, he commands believers to be filled with the Spirit. This is a command. And then he adds five additional participles explaining what being filled with the Spirit looks like. It looks like speaking in psalms, singing and making music, giving thanks to God the Father, and submitting to each other out of reverence for Christ. So I just wonder what it might look like, even in your own context with your own ministry team, speaking in psalms, singing praise, offering thanks to God, and then submitting to each other. What would that look like? For Paul, it meant stepping out of society's prescribed hierarchy and caring for your brothers and sisters as though they really are your brothers and sisters. Although when I say that line to high schoolers, I have to kind of rephrase it because I actually don't want them maybe to treat each other like their brothers and sisters, but that's for another day. We can talk to Denise about that. Um, we see an example, I think, of this unity, this desire for unity, and Paul's call for it in the Philippian church. And I'm gonna use Yodia and Syntyche, the co-workers of Paul, to kind of think through what might be going on here. We don't know if they are Jew or Gentile. And, and in my Philippian commentary, I suggest that they're both Gentiles. But now I'm not so sure. I might change my mind. So anyway, new thought. You can ask me questions afterwards or tell me, oh, you're all wet. And, um, but I'm wondering if Yodia is actually Jewish. We know of at least four Jewish women with that name uh, around this time, uh, based on Tal Alon. She has a lexicon of Jewish names in late antiquity. And looking at the diaspora evidence. Syntyche is obviously a Greek name, and while it is possible for a Jewish family to name their daughter after the goddess of fate, seems unlikely. So 
I'm suggesting that these co-workers of Paul might represent a Jew-Gentile situation of disunity. You know, Paul calls upon, and I'm drawing now on Philippians 4, Paul calls upon Yodia and Syntyche to be of the same mind. And he, this is a repeat of the phrase that he uses in chapter 2, verse 2, to be of the same mind, to the whole congregation. To the Romans, Paul also uses this phrase as he encourages them to think of, of one another above themselves. You find this in chapter 12. Or to live in one mind, to live in harmony. Um, that would be in chapter 15. In fact, we only, we could even turn to 1 Corinthians, the first three chapters, and we can see how distressed Paul is with the disunity uh, in that congregation. The unity of the local body mattered to Paul. And so he's, he's going to stress here uh, this unity, this singleness of mind with Yodia and Syntyche. Now, there are a few commentators who argue that uh, these two women, their, their problem is minor or unimportant. But most recent commentaries say, no, this concern for unity is central to the letter, if not the primary reason that Paul wrote the letter. The, they mention in part because it's very rare for Paul to single out named individuals. Um, let me just talk a little bit about what we might uh, imagine for Yodia and Syntyche, who they might be. It's likely that the Philippian churches met in, uh, the, the church met in several houses, like happened in Corinth. So it's possible that these women led their respective house churches. We know of Nympha, she's mentioned in Colossians 4, and Lydia in Acts 16, and then of course Priscilla and Aquila, Romans 16. They have churches that meet in their homes. And in the first century, the social system of patronage was quite strong. Paul drew on that, of course, when he stayed with Lydia uh, in, in Philippi. And while patrons often held great informal power within a community, it's possible that uh, Yodi and Syntyche not only might be patrons of the Philippian church and maybe patrons of Paul, some commentators say maybe these women were also part of the group that's mentioned at the beginning of Philippians, namely the Episcopoi and Diakonoi. At the beginning of Paul's letter to Philippians, he addresses it to all the churches, and then he mentions uh, Episcopoi, bishops or overseers, and Diakonoi, deacons. Philippians is the only letter wherein Paul notes these two groups at the opening, and then you have these two women mentioned, named people mentioned. Anyway, so some people put those uh, facts together and conclude that maybe Yodi and Syntyche even held these titles. Well, we can speculate, I don't know, but Paul at least specifically states that they are his co-workers. They've worked alongside Paul in the gospel. They disagree with each other. They are not together in disagreement against Paul. Would it have been a theological dispute? I, I'm not real persuaded by that because I think Paul would have been able to answer their theological question in, in the letter. Some suggest, and I'm in this camp, that there was a disagreement on practice. How are they living out their faith in Christ? Um, now, possibility is that they were um, trying to live out their faith in Christ through the practice of the, the social hierarchy that existed uh, at this time. Uh, I'd mentioned last night friendship. Even friendship as a social category was agonistic. That is, it was highly competitive. Uh, so maybe they are trying to outdo each other uh, for honor, amongst all of the other believers. Maybe they're in a court battle. Think of 1 Corinthians 6. So maybe that's something that's going on. The fact that Paul mentions a mediator leads some people to say that that's what they think is, is happening. Uh, 
it's possible, especially if they were deacons, um, that maybe the two of them were overseeing the administration of aid. I'm thinking of Acts 6, right? And so maybe they had different ideas or one thought the other wasn't paying enough attention to a particular group that needed help. All kinds, those are just some ideas, but here's a fourth one. What if the issue is rooted in the Jew-Gentile divide? What if the stress point in this is at meals and social gatherings? I'm wondering if their Gentile and Jewish backgrounds led them to imagine holiness in a different way. Yodia valued the Sabbath. Syntyche, eh. Right? One day's the same as the next. Did Yodia insist that church gatherings be meat free? And Syntyche shows up with a ham and cheese sandwich. You know, what if the issue uh, is this struggle of Jewish and Gentile believers trying to worship well together, but having different visions about what the holy life, which we're all called to lead, what that holy life looks like. But for Paul, unity matters because it matters to Christ. Christ made the two, even Yodi and Syntyche, he made the two one, one new anthropos, and believers are to act like that because that action of unity shows the world how the impossible becomes possible with God. So I was thinking about this, my mind was drawn to Acts chapter 10, Cornelius's salvation. You know, Peter is there and he begins to present the gospel. He says, you know the message that God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins in his name. And Peter, you can just see he's got his head of steam going, right? And he's preaching. And then he's interrupted by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came down on all who heard the message. And Peter and all of his Jewish compatriots, they did not expect this. Why would the Holy Spirit, holy is not his first name, right? That is a descriptor. Why would the Holy Spirit come upon an unholy man, a Gentile idolater? But it happened. <laughs> the proof of Cornelius's conversion is the irrefutable presence of the Holy Spirit in him and those who are around him. Peter would later declare, if God gave them the same gift that he gave us Jews, us Jews who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? So actions speak louder than words sometimes, and that impossible unity of Jew-Gentile, that happens through the power of the Holy Spirit, those who are made one new anthropos in Christ. So for Yodi and Syntyche, having the same mind evidenced that they had the mind of Christ, that they were living into that sure promise that they will be transformed into the likeness of his glorious body. As Paul mentions, uh, just before he talks about Yodi and Syntyche, he mentions for all the believers that they are awaiting a savior. Their citizenship is in heaven and they await a savior and they will be transformed into the likeness of his glorious body. We can turn to 1 Corinthians for a second example. You know that Paul sharply rebukes the wealthy Corinthians in chapter 11, verses 17 and following. They are disregarding the body, that is the church, because they are denigrating the slaves and the free poor who arrive at the communion meal later. In fact, Paul declares it's an absolute disgrace for one of you to eat a hearty meal in front of another person who is hungry. Paul says, don't even call this a communion meal. Why were the Corinthians doing this? The social custom of the day was to proclaim or present a person's self-worth 
by giving important people meat, fresh fruit, you know, variety in the meal, while giving other people at the same meal, I don't know, hard bread and lima beans or Brussels sprouts. It's bad. Paul says, no wonder your Christian community is so weak, so lacking in God's strength. You are humiliating those who have nothing. Today, I think we tend to miss the social reality of this text when we view it only through the lens of personal piety and confession of our personal sins. But Paul targeted the wealthy and their acts of humiliation against those who had nothing. So submitting to each other out of reverence for Christ in that context might mean that an owner would offer food and serve her slave, or a father might serve his daughter. Supporting each other meant bearing social shame or dishonor that some in the church carried, such as the slaves. It could mean that the wealthier in the church supported Christian businesses. So for example, it could mean that Gentile believers went to Prisca and Aquila's shop for leather repairs, even if they might be shunned by others in their family for supporting a Jewish business. Having seen these specific examples of what submitting to each other out of reverence for Christ might look like within Paul's churches in relation to the Jew and Gentile divide and also the social economic categories, I'd like to turn to one more division in their culture. And that revolves around the institution of slavery. Paul discusses the institution of slavery when he speaks to slaves and owners in chapter six of Ephesians, verses 5 through 9. I think this is one of the hardest passages of Scripture for American Christians to read. That is, white American Christians, or at least it should be. Our history of racialized, institutionalized slavery haunts us to this day. It's a slavery that is based on the myth of triumphant whiteness. I'm sharing my ideas with you, very cognizant of my white skin color. In a recent hermeneutics class in, at Northern Seminary where I taught, there was an African-American female pastor and she spoke about her lack of, her, her frustration at Paul's lack of response, her perceived, her impression of Paul's lack of response to slavery. We had a good discussion and I respect her opinion very much. And I realize that my exegesis of this pa passage, even right now, will not be able to do full justice to the complexity of the ancient institution of slavery, nor its modern counterparts. I weep at the way that this passage has been used to promote violence, a particular form of violence in our country, racism. I would have loved for Paul here to have shouted, I almost said write in capital letters, but he actually did write all in capital letters at this time. That was what they used. But I would want Paul to shout against the institutional of slavery here. From my perspective, I, there's no shouting. Nevertheless, I do believe that Paul destroys the foundations on which slavery is built because it was built on the practice of domination, domination of some over others. In Paul's day, slavery was horrible. It wasn't racialized the way the American experience was, but it was horrible. And I, I, I'll say it a third time, it was horrible. I don't actually wanna go into all the horribleness. You can, I, some of it in my, uh, commentary, but please don't believe anybody that says that it really wasn't that bad um, in the ancient world. The slave was owned uh, their body, all of it, and just imagine what I mean by that. Okay. Ironically though, perhaps Paul's own Roman citizenship was based on a member of his family uh, back a couple generations being enslaved. 
his father or his grandfather could have been enslaved during maybe Pompey's crackdown on Jerusalem in 63 BC, or maybe when the Roman governor Varus goes in in 4 BC, there was a rebellion after Herod the Great died, puts down a, a revolt. There, so it's possible that uh, in, in those two cases, uh, one of the Jewish slaves shipped, uh, shipped out of that area was uh, a relative of Paul's. It was a practice in the ancient world that an owner would put in his or her will that a slave should be manumitted at the owner's death. And if the owner had uh, Roman citizenship, then that would be granted to the slave. So Paul says he was born a Roman citizen, and that is not something common at all in Paul's day. In an, a later period, another 100, 150 years, it becomes much more common, but not during Paul's lifetime. As we turn to the passage uh, there in chapter six in Ephesians, I'd like to highlight a couple of points so that we understand Paul's message as best we can. First, remember what Paul has promised to all of the believers in these five chapters. Paul declared, as we saw in chapter two, that every believer has an inheritance. That would have been amazing news to slaves. Remember, a slave has no legal parents. They have no legal descendants. They have no family. But in Christ, they do have a family. A slave woman is a member of God's family, and that includes having an inheritance. Second, Paul honors slaves by speaking to them first before addressing their owners. In fact, it's actually astonishing that Paul speaks to slaves at all. Most, if not all, and actually I can't think of a place where Gentile writers wrote on, who wrote on slavery, talk to slaves, but I wrote most, if not all, because I'm a careful scholar. So there may, may be out there, I just don't know where it is. <laughs> but if you think of the philosophers at that time, Seneca writes on this, he's, he's always writing to owners, even if he's telling owners to be careful, he's still writing only to owners. Paul's letter is read aloud to the whole group. Everyone hears that the slave's obedience is seen and valued by the Lord. Paul indicates that the slave's work, although mandated by her owner, is nevertheless an opportunity for him to model the character of Christ. So the labor of a slave, even the humiliation that the slave endures, is done as though to Christ himself, and that gives those actions value and there, there is also a promised reward. Third, Paul declares here that slaves can do good things. Now, I know that doesn't sound maybe radical to us, but that was revolutionary at the time. Slaves were seen as inferior, made so by the very institution to which fate consigned them. The Romans believed that the slave must be beaten in order to work hard and to speak truthfully. We see this, uh, for example, in the courts. Anytime a slave was going to present evidence in any way, they were always tortured beforehand. We have an example in the early second century, Pliny the Younger, who was governor of Bithynia. He writes to Emperor Trajan, and he has some questions about how to handle Christians, because this is, again, early second century. So the Roman Empire is just kind of trying to wrap their minds around this new thing called Christians. And he indicates to Emperor Trajan that he's trying to find out more about this group. I mean, he kills them if they don't honor the emperor. He knows that part. But you know, what if they were accused of being a Christian, but they do honor the emperor? Should he just let them go? Or do they have to punish him? I don't know. It's letter 10, uh, 96 to 97, if you're at all interested. We love Google. Um, anyway, so he wants to find out more about him. What does he do? He tortures two female slaves who he calls deaconesses. And then he laments, he discovered nothing but, quote, depraved, excessive superstition. 
the gospel message that Pro Paul proclaimed says that God's kingdom admits no social hierarchy. Its king is a crucified and risen Lord. So the early Christians, they didn't tackle the Roman legal system, but they did act counterculturally by treating slaves as full members of their community. Also remember that Paul notes God has prepared good works for all believers to walk in. 2 verse 10. He challenges Ephesians to do good works with their hands, to share with others, and to speak what is good, to speak what is helpful, to build others up. That's at the end of chapter 4. Both the slave and the free, then, are under obligation to do good deeds, to speak good thoughts. God has laid those out for them to walk in, and that will bless the church and then bring the gospel before all people. Paul even describes slaves as having the capacity to know the will of God and to do it, 6 verse 6. That's an astonishing statement given the prejudices of the day. Paul elevates the slaves' deeds as those done unto Christ, and so that effectively undercuts the evaluation of the slave owner. And then in 6-9, Paul turns his gaze to the owners, and those owners would be men and women, Perhaps even, and this is kind of odd to me, but even some freed men and freed women might also own slaves. Paul says masters are to treat slaves in the same way. Now, what does Paul mean there, that phrase, in the same way? Well, the fourth century church father, Chrysostom, he argues that Paul urges owners to serve their slaves. Well, that language would certainly fit Jesus' words that the one who leads should be a servant of all, you know, Mark 10. At the very least, Paul orders masters to follow the same principled behaviors as that enjoined for slaves because the Lord tolerates no special treatment for those socially privileged, and that would include the owners. Not only are masters to do the same thing, but they are to cease threatening their slaves. Do not threaten. Now that threat might be the use of a whip. It may be the threat to sell a child or a partner. Slaves couldn't marry, but they did uh, form couples at times. That couple could be divided. Or even just to deny food or drink or proper clothing. Paul takes away the owner's power to threaten violence and also the, before God, the power to make good on those threats. And that undermines the very ability of the master to control their slaves. Paul does not include a caveat that disobedient slaves can be threatened or that those who do wrong can be intimidated. I have seen that in some commentaries, but I can't find it actually in the biblical text. There is no caveat here. It just says, do not threaten. The domination that characterized the institution of slavery has no place within the church. So what does it mean then here when Paul describes Christ as master or Lord? Paul is not projecting earthly characteristics of owners that he and everyone in the church would know. He's not projecting those earthly characteristics onto Christ, but he actually is inviting believers to think differently about what master means. Who is this master of heaven? Well, it's none other than Christ the Lord, the one who was crucified and raised and now sits at the Father's hand, right hand. This is the one who shows no favoritism, who does not count social status as determining a person's worth, and who welcomes all into his family, counts him as a member of his body. In our country, I would say it was, it's arguable that Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin did more to shift public sentiment against slavery than... Uh, than any exegetical arguments, mainly because there was a human at the center of it all. That, that human element is so poignantly displayed when the runaway Eliza and her son arrive at the doorstep of John and Mary Bird. The couple had just discussed the fugitive slave laws that require the return of any runaway. 
And Mary Bird declares that God commands her to feed the hungry and clothe the naked, and that would include runaway slaves. But her husband, John, who's a senator in Ohio, responds, well, that could result in grave harm because of general public unrest. Mrs. Bird, she's not going to have any of that. And even more, she believes that her husband would not turn away a shivering, forlorn slave. Well, their servant interrupts right about this point, and she asks Mrs. Bird to come into the kitchen. And then a little bit later, Mrs. Bird asks her husband to come into the kitchen. And there, in the kitchen, is this half-frozen Eliza with her little boy, Henry. Suddenly, the couple's debate shifts from the abstract to the real flesh and blood mother and child who need their help. Suddenly, it was personal. And I would say for Paul and the early Christians, it was also personal. About 20% of the early Gentile believing communities were slaves, and, and maybe even more in Rome because that had the largest uh, slave population. Each of these believers, including the slaves, they were co-heirs with their fellow believers. Each was a stone that was used in the Lord's temple. A slave might be a pastor, an evangelist, or a teacher. That is, Christ's gift to the church. I'm thinking of chapter 4, verse 11. In fact, tradition holds that Philemon's slave, Onesimus, became bishop of Ephesus. And we saw that Pliny tortured two female deaconesses. The slave children and the freeborn in that Ephesian church worshiped together alongside their slave, freed, and free caregivers. Paul identifies each believer as his brother or sister. That gives the slaves a family. Right? Slave and free alike approach the throne of grace. The Lord himself, though being in very nature God, yet took up the very nature of a slave, that humiliation that resulted through the cross in his exaltation. So the scope of Christ's work, that work on the cross, extends from our personal forgiveness to the remaking of the people of God. How do we live that out today? How do we, in our American society, which has social hierarchy also, which favors certain people over other people. How do we embrace in our local communities and in our conversations that profound truth that God shows no favoritism, but has instead pulled us together into one body, one new anthropos, each individual redeemed by the cross and through the cross creating a new humanity? It's an invitation for us to live into that new reality, starting now. Thank you. Be happy to address questions or comments. Yes, sir. Right. So my, I guess my question is in that, do you, do you believe that Stoicism was at all influenced Marcus Aurelius's brand by that early Christian uh, Again, just pure uh, Yeah. Um, I would doubt that. If, uh, just because at that point, Christian writings even, you would have you know, Justin Martyr's apology, but I just don't think it would have raised to the level of the Roman court in that way to be influential. But 
I'm thinking of uh, Seneca, who would be right at the time of Paul, and his uh, essay on benefits or on gifts, he talks, he raises the question, can a slave give a gift? And it's a very important question because it's, I've talked about once you give a gift, you are, you receive a gift from someone, you are beholden to them. So if a slave gives a gift to an owner, now the owner is obligated to the slave. And that seems just an absolute impossibility. But Seneca says, nope, a slave can give a gift. They can give their life, let's say, in protecting. And he gives some examples of a slave who protected their owner dying in that effort. So Seneca, almost at the end, you think, so he's going to say the institution of slavery should be abolished. Right. Eventually, if you go, he says, you know, if you go back far enough in someone's history, you'll find they they have some ancestor who was born free, right? So not like Aristotle, where some were humans were created to to be slaves. I mean that that just was their nature. The the Stoics at the time of Paul aren't going to argue. They're not going to argue that. But what troubles me. Uh, so much, I think, about the Stoic, even though they're, they're advocating for, for more mild behavior towards slaves, they're doing so not for the sake of the slave, but for their own practice of um, apatheia, right? The, we call it apathy, but back then, apatheia was more just trying not to be um, controlled by events. Um, so, your two-year-old daughter dies, well, that's disappointing. Um, and we have a letter of a Stoic who writes to his wife, you know, let's remember our sweet little daughter, but, you know, at least we had her for a little bit. And not to give way to grief, not to give way. So that's one point. And then I would say the second point is by... Um, by making slavery into an abstraction, that you don't want to be slaves to your passion, it prevents you from seeing the real life of actual slaves. And I think Seneca realizes he could never have his life without slaves doing all kinds of stuff for him. So, and he doesn't, I don't think he wouldn't want to give, you know, give up that leisure. So I think by stylizing, you know, we, none, all of us could be brutish slaves as we give in to our passions. Uh, but actually, some people really were slaves, and they, on their body, they bore the marks. Yeah. Just a follow-up. So the interesting thing about Marcus Aurelius, uh, his sister died, and he writes a letter, and he expresses great sympathy and great. So you know, you hear that you hear the, the, the saying, "There are no." Yeah, well, his slaves end up, uh, for Seneca, slitting his wrists and making his bath hot, so he dies instead of being killed and tortured by Nero, so in the end, they help him out. Yes, sir, way in the back. Right, thanks for bringing that great question up. Not just Paul, but Peter and James, they all identify themselves as a slave of the Lord. And that, I think, can be especially traced back to uh, their Jewish roots and into the Old Testament, where that language about serving the one true God, uh, being a servant in the, in the uh, house of the Lord, continues on. Yeah, yeah. I think they had, I, I don't know specifically the question that, that you're asking. I think we, I'd feel more comfortable like looking at individual texts to see. However, there are several different terms that we can translate, like household slave, 
a slave working in the mines or in the fields has a very different experience than an educated male slave who runs the books. You see, think of Joseph's experience, you know, as, as someone trusted um, for at least a while before he's thrown in prison. But yes. The slavery text. Uh, well, I think it it should embolden us to do more uh, against the sorts of slavery that exists today in the world, uh, the human trafficking, uh, spending more time again against that. Um, I I think it. Uh, because the American slavery was rooted in uh, racism, I think this passage uh, I think it compels us. I was going to say invite, but that wasn't strong enough. I think it compels us to um, to take seriously how changes need to happen um, in our particular congregations and our, our particular areas. I'm in Chicago, right? And, and so there are a lot of African Americans, including in my office. I, I, um, I have that environment that I'm, and, and the violence in Chicago in the black community is horrific. So how do, how do I, as the white, highly educated woman, live into that. I think first and foremost, it's listening to those who are most impacted by it and receiving from them uh, what, what I might need to, to do to help. But I haven't always lived in that kind of environment, so I hate to give a prescription that might not fit in your area. Am I getting at what you're asking or no? I would, I'm with you on uh, the, the way in which our social activities impin the church. I think where I would um, push back a little bit or distinguish my answer is I, I, I wouldn't probably make slavery there as much of a metaphor as what you were just doing. I think there is that. But you can find what you're talking about in chapter four. <laughs> yes, sir. And then up, and then you're. Yes. Chapter two. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. I do think that Paul is, is thinking of social categories here. I don't think that he is spiritualizing the inner man and the outer man. I think he means actual Jews who were circumcised and Gentiles who were uncircumcised. Now, to your point, he will, at other places, talk about the inner man. In fact, even in chapter 3, he'll talk about the renewal of the inner man, but I don't think he's doing it in chapter 2. Those are real categories of Jew and Gentile coming together, and that's part of the redemption. Uh, 
that Paul sees in, um, in Isaiah, for example, being promised that all will come up to uh, all, all the people. God's promised that, that all people would be drawn to him. So that the Gentiles coming to faith is an eschatological moment for Paul. There are certain parallels, yes. I would not go with the, um, with the argument that we can transpose employee and employer here. I, I would push against that because Paul could have said that. <laughs> um, this, is, this is a real category. And, and the thing that is uh, so uh, problematic about the slave situation in the ancient world was you always had that social stain. It just, it would not wash off. I mean, in Christ it washed off, but publicly speaking, it didn't. And I think there are examples of that in our country today. I think um, it's very hard for uh, those coming out of prison to ever kind of have a social standing again. Um, those who uh, faced bankruptcy, uh, we had friends that had that experience. I think that social, they felt a social shame that was really hard to ever come out of. So in that sense, I think the economics or there are social situations that in our day and, a cap, day, day and time capture the, uh, the social stain that, that leaves such a mark. Yeah. Clint? Yeah. And then I'll come to you. I think the, uh, because things were so hierarchical, everyone submitted to someone. So the adult son would submit to his father. Um, even the emperor submitted to the gods. So at one level, everyone was raised to, to assume they're going to submit to someone. That's how the order was kept. What the gospel did was kind of uh, take that kind of one one um, sort of relationship, sibling, and said, okay, that's the model that we're gonna use. We're gonna be siblings, where you don't have that uh, inherent hierarchy, and that's gonna be the model that, that we'll use. So it's not so much that submission was a bad word. It was the idea that people who normally would submit to me don't do so in the same way. Moreover, I have to submit to people that wider culture says I don't have to. Am I, am I getting at your question? I I think it was. I, no one else is doing it except maybe the Essenes. We don't have a lot of evidence uh, to them. I don't even think the cynics are doing something like this. This is very, it, it's just new. And now the synagogue doesn't have a high, um, they, they don't highly stratify, uh, stratify in, in the synagogues, but now it, it, it's what shows the gospel. Right, that we're all one in Christ. That 
that just irritated the Romans. I mean, it called into question their, their whole way of life. Yeah. That's right, that's right. So God shows no favoritism. That's where I would go with, with what you're saying. And I think uh, there is, um, there can be uh, a sense that what is mine is what I'm going to keep. And so I don't, with open arms, welcome another. So you're exactly right. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And that, um, the, when, when the abolitionists were in, in the United States were uh, talking about uh, abolishing slavery, very few, only a handful, mentioned this big elephant in the room, which was racism. Um, no one no one even imagined that a black man could own a white man, right? So the discussion was, uh, was just missing the main, the main argument. And I think that's what you're also pointing out is this prejudice that can leave a blind spot in, in our thinking such that we don't demonstrate the generosity and we live with this sense that God does favor us. And he, he actually does favor us. We, uh, we are granted the grace to suffer as Jesus suffered so that we might also then be raised with him. So God does favor us, but not um, in, the, in the way that the world favors. And that's the prejudice that you're pointing out. Thank you. One more question? Uh, yes, sir. Or, uh, you know what? I'm so excited. Were you going to ask a question? Okay. And, you know, I was going to be a little, every once in a while in some of my classes, I get a little snarky and say, okay, the men have asked all the questions. Where's the woman? So let's do two questions, all right? Okay. Please. And then we'll finish up. <laughs> 
And I appreciate your, uh, no, I, I, I just kind of, I want to say amen. I think the, the burden of my uh, reading last night and tonight is to, to think about who we are as believers as having a social component to it, right? And that I was raised that, you know, you just give your life life to the Lord, you know, and you're saved. And then you, you just try and do your best. And then your soul will go to heaven. And I, I uh, our, our sins are taken on the cross. So I absolutely don't want to minimize that. But the social piece is integral to things. And I think that's what you're reminding us of with that. It's a burden for us. It's something we shouldn't let go. Yeah. Such a profound comment. I almost hesitate to go into the last question. I, I, the issues with racial divide and, and reconciliation, I think, are very, very real. But I want to pivot away from that. And if you look at what Paul says, he is our peace, and there's this social division between Jews and Gentiles. And I think in our American culture today, in our churches, one of the things I mean, there's, there, there's honestly no place for it. You know, there, there is a place, I think, for honest and mature discussion. So that's where I would see, let's say, in Philippians chapter 3, I don't know, 12 through 17. You know, Paul is talking there about, as, as you mature, and you're going to be talking about stuff, right? Or in Ephesians 4, right? Where... There's, there's this maturity as we grow up into the head. That, that means people are talking, right? People are talking with each other. They had councils like the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. Um, so they needed to work through things. Um, but in today's um, soundbite world, people aren't, uh, aren't doing that. And it may also be the case that maybe we don't talk too long about things. So your idea of ice cream is actually an excellent one. <laughs> um, in as much as uh, sometimes continuing to talk about it, realizing that they're just holding different positions, exacerbates the, the, the process. Then what you have to do, I think, is say, well, what do we stand on? Where's our foundation? And, and kind of come back to that. But I don't... Uh, it's prayer. It, to me, like that conversation that you're saying or about masks or not masks or whatever, uh, we have to remember that Satan wants to divide us. So I go back time and again to 2 Corinthians. I'm wagging my finger here. Uh, 2 Corinthians, where Paul asks that they forgive the repentant believer so they come together again. He says, because we, we are all, we are not unaware of Satan's schemes. And I think that is, uh, is something we want to remember because we do have an enemy and it's not us. Well, and that's a good word to end on, right? That we serve his kingdom first. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thanks. You're only allowed to have ice cream if you get your picture taken. So... Everybody up here? And Robin's going to take the picture. So just squeeze. <laughs>
here in the 